<laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to dismiss our children. We got children's church going on again. Yep. We haven't started up our bus route yet. We're still we're still considering what to do about that. Bear with us. All right. This morning, I'd like to uh, bring your attention to another verse. The next one in line in our study of Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 25. Remember, Paul just said that he was rejoicing to suffer for the sake of the church in filling up what was lacking in the afflictions of Christ. We looked at that last week. Now we're going to look at verse 25, where, where he was made a minister, a minister for the church. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, for ministers such as Paul. You took him out of a rough uh, life situation where his heart was, was in the wrong place, but you poured yourself into him and you made him a mighty servant. This is a time in our world, Lord, where we need some mighty servants to be raised up. And thank you that we have the Holy Spirit to fill us and empower us, to guide us. We want to be lights to this world. And we want Jesus to shine through us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Paul said he was made a minister. A couple important words there. He was made. He didn't make himself. He was made a minister. And a minister is a servant. Paul was chosen by God, empowered by God, directed by God to be able to be a servant to God's people. He sees his ministry as a stewardship from God that was bestowed on him. It's God's ministry. It was given over to Paul to serve in the cause of lifting up God's son, Jesus. He saw it as a stewardship. He applied his time. He applied his effort. He did what he could. He did his share, as we saw in the last verse. He took the stewardship from God. He realized the stewardship was a way to serve for your benefit, the church's benefit. He, a servant gives his life over to being a blessing to others. God's people. God's people matter to God. And God appoints servants to benefit his people. Now, the way that Paul was intended to minister was to carry out the preaching of the word. If you understand that carefully, it's the word that benefits the church, which are the people of God that Paul has come to minister. It's the truth in ourselves so that we can be fruitful for God and advancing it out there beyond these walls. We're ambassadors for Christ. We have a message to bear to the nations. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Paul, his wonderful example as a Christian servant. Thank you that you chose him and you changed his life radically. His message, just the message of the testimony of his life, of you working in his life, shows us that we should never, ever give up on anyone. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to to trust, to hope, And to just dare to be encouraging. This world needs some encouragement. It needs hope. It needs the gospel, the good news of Jesus. 
And Lord, we want to be servants that are that are faithful at bringing this word to everyone. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've had a very heavy heart yesterday. Um, I went to bed Friday night watching a, a, an attack on the White House. Uh, sure, the, the Secret Service were defending, but just to think about the, the level to which our country has descended into heartache and division and strife. And it is a dangerous time. And my heart was heavy. I woke up in the morning with a heavy heart. Then I got a, a I saw on my Facebook timeline or my news feed uh, a post by someone I highly respect, someone who is a world champion barber shopper. He has a part of he, he he sings a part in a quartet that that won the entire world a few years ago in their competition, and he's an amazing genius. And I really look up to him. And he said in his post that it's time we start burning things down because nobody's listening to us. And I dared to respond as politely as I could. Uh, rioting is not the way the system is working. And immediately I sparked a long string of attacks. Oh uh, yeah. What do you expect that old white guy to say? <laughs> and I foolishly started trying to hold back the flood of hatred and it just wasn't working. I eventually had to delete my comment to delete that thread. And then someone said, hey, where'd that, where'd that racist pastor uh, thread go? And so I chimed back in and said, well, I deleted it because it wasn't helping the way I intended. And then uh, the, the fellow who put out the post in the first place gave me a little credit and said, I'm sorry, I'm going to take this post down. <laughs> So maybe a little good was accomplished. I don't know. Uh, and then again, last night, more attacks, more brutal, vicious, uh, oh, just awful, selfish attacks. I, I totally understand the frustration that people have when they see things like the video that came out of that man that was killed in Minneapolis. It was horrific. It was awful. It certainly uh, was a shame that it had to happen that way. And there were people that in their indignation were really upset about it, and I don't blame them. And they were out there in a way that they thought they could help by just being angry and shouting, you know, fix this problem. And I kind of agree with that. But you see, what happened was, there were some very evil forces and some hate groups behind the scenes provoking people to violence. And they burned down people's lives, entire life savings spent on, on a business venture, and it's gone because some selfish people out there having fun, smoking marijuana, getting drunk, throwing things at the police, and burning things down. It is wrong. It is awful. It is, oh, I don't have words for it. And I don't mean to go on and on about it. And I think, is our problem, is our, is our fight against flesh and blood? Absolutely not. These are dear people that are misguided, that have a bright future if they would trust Jesus. And we mustn't think that, that it's, it's time to fight back in any, any mean-spirited way. It's true. This world is messed up. This world is in, in, in the throes of, of violence inspired by the evil one who is the, a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies. Our struggle is against him. 
And I don't want anybody to give up on anybody. I don't think there's a person in this world that's so far lost that God's love won't reach them. And I want to show you something. I want to show you something from the Bible that shows exactly where the worst terrorist could be in a few years. All right, let's do this. This is the story of a man who was made a minister by Jesus. Turns out he was a violent person that threw rocks or actually held coats for others that they could throw rocks. All right. When they had driven him, this is Stephen, a Christian man, out of the city, they began stoning him. They stoned him because he dared to tell them that Jesus loved them and that they were wrong to have crucified him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul was a young Jewish man. He was interested in justice. He was one of these people that would get swept up in the fervor of going against some kind of a problem. And he would even do it to the point of saying, here, let me hold your coat so you can throw that rock harder. Because we're going to kill this guy because he dared to say that we were wrong. And he dared to say that Jesus is the way of salvation. So let's hurt him. Let him suffer. This was Paul. He did it in a misguided way. He thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was helping God's cause. I think a lot of the protesters think they're helping God's cause. And I think it's time we listen to each other. Hello, is it such a thing that we, we have to just fight back and get violent and get in people's face and show disrespect? Or can we actually have a conversation? Well, Paul was not interested in a conversation. He was interested in wiping out Stephen and other Christians. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Acts 8, verse 1, And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. People were burnt down. They were, they were, were, were fought out. They were, they were dragged to prison. They were dragged out and stoned. This was a violent mob attack on God's community. A great persecution arose. Who do you suppose was behind that early persecution? in the church. Do you think Paul should have been considered a, a, a reprobate enemy that had no hope in a future? No. Paul was misguided. Paul was wrong. He was doing the wrong thing. But the story didn't end there. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. When the church is pressed, when the church is shut down, when the church is, is attacked, God goes to work. And that's when the church is at its strongest, when they're depending on God to do the work he meant for them to do. And they went to Samaria. They also went beyond Samaria. Because of that attack, the entire world got to hear the gospel. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house. It's getting to the point where I'm worried. Our, our world is getting so violent. And if you have the wrong skin color, they may just come in and drag you out of your house and stone you to death because you're guilty by having the wrong skin color. I don't care what skin color you want to attribute to that statement. It can be true both ways. And it's ridiculous. And Paul would go into the houses and drag out the people who dared to believe in Jesus. And he would drag them off, men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. So our response, when we're attacked... 
And our response when our culture is on fire needs to be to preach the word. The word is the answer. I apologized to that thread saying, I didn't mean to stir up a can of worms. We all need Jesus. He loves everybody and he knows the, the heartaches you feel. And uh, he's the answer. Please trust him. So we have a little in common, at least our time period, with this time period in the book of Acts. And it's concerning. It can be very frightening. And it's frustrating. And I think it's a generational thing. You know, I think that, that such is happening in this world that, that history is not really being remembered. If you forget your history, you're doomed to repeat it. And there were wonderful times in our history when people like Rosa Parks protested by sitting in her seat on a bus and refusing to get up just because she was black. She's a hero. She didn't fight. She peacefully sat in a seat. And it led to great improvements. Martin Luther King Jr. never burned down a building. Never killed anyone. But indeed, he helped to change the world for the better. Now I'm afraid that the violence that's being uh, spewed everywhere, it being misguided, I don't think those people are, are reprobates. I don't think they're beyond hope. But I think they're setting us back to a time when we can't trust and we can't come together and have a conversation. The system is working. People who do wrong, people in places of power, they can either be voted out or they can be fired. There's a lot of accountability. We all have cell phones. We can take videos. People are interested in seeing the world get better. It's not a time to be violent. And we've come a long way. America has elected a black president twice. Do you think that would have happened back in the 40s and 50s? No. Remember history. We're a lot better now than we were. And yeah, we have a bad history. We have things in our past to be ashamed of. But you know what Jesus has done through his people? He's created change. In America, we're equal. Yeah, there's mistakes, of course. People run the system, and people are flawed. Don't just expect perfection. That's selfish. It's entitled. You think you have a right to go burn down a post office or a hospital? Crazy. Wrong. Wrong-headed. And yet God loves you. And you may be just like Paul who was a violent aggressor against the church, who was in favor of stoning people to death, imprisoning them for their beliefs, controlling what they would think. What happened to Paul? Acts 9, 1 and 2. Now Saul, that's his Hebrew name, right? Just like I'm John, in, in, in Spanish-speaking areas of the world, they might call me Juan. Well, Saul and Paul are the same person. Same name, just a different language. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. He wanted to spread his terror all the way up to Syria, so that if he found any belonging to the way, the way, the way is the Christian way, the people who love one another, the people who reach out for Jesus and want to see souls saved, and they don't 
just want to make enemies of their enemies because their Savior said, love one another and love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If you found any belonging to that peace-loving way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Boy, he wasn't going to be stopped. He was vicious. Actually, in his mind, he was on the right side of this problem. This Christian thing that's happening is a problem, and i got to stop it because I love God. That was pretty much his attitude. What happened to him when he was on the way? Acts 9, 4 through 22. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. <laughs> I'm going to get those, those people belonging to the peace-loving way. I'm going to drag them back to Jerusalem, and we're going to stone them. He was on his way approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. What? I thought I was persecuting these awful people that went against our traditions. I thought I was persecuting People who dared to offend uh, the law. You're Jesus. And interesting, isn't it, that when Jesus' people are persecuted, he feels persecuted. He takes it personally. And he reached out in love to Paul. Of all people, Paul. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The man who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. There's a veil between the spirit realm and the physical. And when it opened, a voice could come out for everybody, but it was focused on Paul. And Paul was there and he saw that light. Saul got up from the ground. And though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. A little glimpse blinded him. It's, it's probably the case, and I, I kind of think it is, that he struggled with his eyesight the rest of his life. In one of his letters, he, he says, See, I'm signing this with my own hand. Look at my oversized letters, <laughs> right? Like I got to sign it this big in order to be able to read it. Um, and he said that you guys love me so much, you would have, if possible, pulled out your own eyes and given them to me. So sometimes we bear a cross when we're called to serve Jesus. Paul struggled with his eyesight. And he couldn't see anything. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So he's going as fast as he can to do evil to God's people thinking all the while that he's doing good. And nothing was going to stop him. He was bent on getting this problem fixed, taking matters into his own hands. But God had a different plan for his life. He's going to show him what he must do. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Ananias is a good guy. We're going to have to look at his example here. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas 
for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. A very reasonable concern, by the way, right? If you were told, go to the ringleader of the people who burned down the, the businesses in Minneapolis, and God said, I want you to be the one to reach out in love to this lost soul. Would you be afraid that maybe it's going to go bad? Well, honestly, I would. I don't want to be afraid. I want to love people. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call upon your name. The Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. Sometimes the Lord tells us to go, and it's not easy. What is the situation we're in now, and how do you go? Well, one of the ways I've gone has been through social media. It's, it's hard. I, I don't want to be put offish and offensive. But it's one of the platforms we can use to get the truth out. Rioting is wrong. The system will listen. Talk to the police. Talk to the mayors. Talk to the people in charge. They will listen. It's a slower process than what you're demanding, but it's a reasonable process to expect that if you want a change, engage the system properly and it'll change. You could reply to some of these things and you might definitely be called an old white person. I was. Not in a very uh, nice way. <laughs> what do you expect from an old white guy? <laughs> I guess I've got a lot against me. I'm old, I'm white, and I'm a guy. Probably some more things too. I believe in Jesus. There's another strike against me. <laughs> but that's one of the ways, and I feel strong that God has me in a position to speak truth, it might fall on deaf ears. It probably is. It might make some people mad, but the truth does. I would hope and pray that I'm, I step out of the way and let the truth do the work. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings of the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Wow. Imagine the mighty testimony that could happen if one of these ringleaders of these rioting groups repented, trusted Jesus, and used that testimony as a platform for bringing a real conversation to fix the problems. And there are real problems that need fixing. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. That means you have power to speak truth effectively. That's what filling with the Holy Spirit means. It means you can have verbal communication that gets through. Because the Holy Spirit is powerful. You go in your flesh, 
flailing all over the place and just saying, I don't like this. Shape up, everybody. Well, that'll fall on deaf ears. But if you have a commission from the Holy Spirit to speak truth in love, it gets through. And Paul was given that gift. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. He joined the group he tried to destroy. Something powerful happened to change him. Paul was not without hope when he was in the midst of all that hatred and fighting and violence. And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues. The same synagogues where he got arrest warrants to go and, and yank out all the Christians. But now he went as a Christian. And he started preaching in their synagogues, saying he is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing when a life is that radically transformed. Absolutely. Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before chief priests, before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Proving by power of his preaching, by reasoning from the word of God, that Jesus is the one that is sent to this world to be our Savior. He is the anointed one, the Christ. The Jews, ever since Moses, were looking for the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the prophet like Moses, who would come and bring a new covenant. We're looking for that. And that was Jesus. And that's the most important question of all. A word to you rioters out there. First of all, we love you, and we want to listen to you, but we don't want to be burned down. But I will say that if you're trusting in your socialism, you're trusting in your philosophy, because that's what's really behind all these protests. It's an organized, professional uh, attack funded by billionaires that are socialists and want to turn America socialist. If you're putting your trust in that, you're barking up the wrong tree. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one God sent to fix this world. Jesus is your only hope. And I hope that you would listen. If we sat down, I'm inviting any of these radical uh, people that are angry at the system, that really want to have a conversation, I will talk with you. I will listen to you, and I will share with you the solution that I know. I dare you. Challenge you. Jesus is the Christ. He changed my life. He, he radically blessed this church with a love that is amazing. He's, he's exactly what we need. So Paul, I'm going to show you a passage in a minute about Paul's own self-assessment. But Paul was amazingly transformed. You can be too. Absolutely. You can be too. 
So here's a passage from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And this is Paul's letter to Timothy, a young pastor in Ephesus, and he's writing some encouragement and some, some instruction. And he pauses here with this, with this praise, this, this, this gushing forth of thankfulness to God. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Paul humbly acknowledges his, his wayward past. Yet, he says, <clears throat> I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. What is the motive of most of these rioters? If you're honest, you have to say, I don't know. It's easy to just say, all they want to do is destroy. Probably true of some of them. But I'm talking to the, the ones that really believe they're in a good cause. Paul was shown mercy because his misguided violence came out of a sincere heart to do the right thing. I think maybe a lot of those violent people out there have a heart to do the right thing. I think it would be great if they could speak their concerns and people would take it to heart that they're really concerns. You know, neither side seems to be listening. But Paul was shown mercy because he acted ignorantly in unbelief. I think a lot of those protesters which are so wrong. Those, those protesters, not so much, but the rioters, so wrong. Yet, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. They're acting ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. There's a much better way than violence. Please believe me. There's a much better way than violence. I'm hearing all these posts, but they didn't listen. They, the world hasn't become perfect yet, so we got to still burn it down. No, 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 no. <laughs> Please listen to reason. Scripture says, woe to the nation that calls evil good and good evil. Burning down businesses of other people is evil. Please see that. The system that is in place is not perfect, but it is responsive to constructive discussion. If you decide it has to be by a violent act that you're going to get their attention, guess what their job is? Their job is to shut you down, to throw you in jail. God gave them that authority. They're an avenger for him against evil. And their purpose is to create a tranquil life for us. And you're making that very hard for them to do. There's a much better way. Come feel the love. We'll love on you. We love people. We're going to believe the best about people. Jesus would want us to. 
It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Remember, Paul is writing this. Among whom I am foremost of all. Paul just called himself the worst sinner of all. And he's declaring that God came, sent his son to save him. Yet for this reason I found mercy so that in me as the foremost of all sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience. As an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. I want you to read the last verse of this paragraph with me. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Y'all willing to be a servant? Are y'all willing to listen. The, the fault is not just on one side. We're the bigger people. We're the better people because we know we're sinners. We know we need to depend on Jesus and our own flesh is going to fail us. We need to love those who are persecuting us. We need to love our enemies and pray for those people who are misguided. Yeah, there's some bad apples among them too, right? And honestly, those people who are just in it to serve the enemy don't have any, any uh, respect for that. There's a lot of people. Some of my youth group kids are seeing that these people that are, are protesting, even the violent ones, are trying to get heard. And they're giving them some, some respect. I think the actions are not worth respecting. But I got to say, the wrong, the fault, the error is on both sides. And there needs to be a real conversation. And there's not. There's not. You know, it, it, it's heartbreaking. We're at a moment in our country where we might not have a country anymore. Honestly. All the wonderful uh, progress our country has made, founded on principles of equality, now this equality is, is much more prominent, yet there's mistakes. All of that gone. Turn it over to the tyrants. The motives of the political system that would replace the one we have are not trustworthy. The political system we have now is flawed enough you want to replace it with something, it's going to be a lot worse. Fix it. And I'm talking to everyone. Fix it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you that you made Paul a minister. Thank you that you showed mercy to him when it seemed like he could not change because he was so wrapped up in his wrong beliefs. Thank you that you used him to teach your people the gospel, the good news. Father, thank you. Thank you that we have a Savior who is perfect. We can put our hope in him and his kingdom is coming. And even right now, Lord, the spirit is moving and people matter. All people matter. Help us not to give up on anyone and to love everyone 
and to be willing to have a conversation that fixes this horrible problem that is tearing our world apart and dividing people who should be loving one another. Thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.